pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Approval. Can you hold on one second? Because Tabitha is starting the video in the back, and so I want to make sure she catches your motions, and she should be out in a second. Okay. She's. Did you start the video? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Can I get a first and a second to approve the board minutes? Mr. Chair, so moved. Motion by Commissioner Jelinski. Second. Second by Commissioner Blaine. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Additions or deletions? Gentlemen? We'll make a motion to accept the Second. Agenda. Motion made by Commissioner Wilson, second by Commissioner Wincher to uh, approve the agenda. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Public works, public hearing. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Thank you, Steve. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Steve. Previously, we had discussed uh, an action that we were requesting the board to take in transferring um, municipal construction funds, state aid municipal construction funds, to our state aid regular construction accounts. So just to maybe recap um, that, that discussion we had previously, the county receives an allotment. We get a percentage of the highway users trust fund. That trust fund is split uh, between construction and maintenance. The construction account then is further split between municipal and regular. The municipal monies have to be spent on construction of county state aid highways within cities under 5,000 population. From time to time that account builds up because we don't have projects uh, and, and within our municipalities, our, our, street, our county state aid highway streets within those municipalities are in fairly good condition. And so what we were asking is to transfer those funds and the, the statute allows that to happen um, so that we could use the funds for a, a regular construction project that we have. One of them would be the resurfacing of County State Aid Highway 8 that we are under contract with. And then we'd also have funds in our regular construction account to leverage any federal funds that may be coming up into the future. And so the way to transfer that account to the regular, the, the municipal construction account to the regular construction account is that we have to notify the commissioner of transportation that we wish to do so, which we have done. We need to hold this hearing of municipalities under 5,000 population and tell them we are going to do that. And then you need to hear if there are any objections to, to us doing that. If there is not, then we'll notify the commissioner of transportation that we did not have any objections. There's 14 days that after this hearing that they may make an objection to the commissioner. And if that does not happen, then the transfer would be made. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, we'd ask uh, that you'd open the hearing to the municipalities if there's any objection and, uh, and see if there are any that exist. Gentlemen, I'll open this public hearing to hear from the municipalities on the transfer municipal construction to regular construction resolution. Mr. Chair, did you you contacted the municipality specifically? I believe because we are a little limited right every, now. With every every municipality was notified by certified mail that the hearing would take place at this time, and instructed to provide comment to. Some contacted us on what this was about, and this was a situation here also, where, where once they understood that we're transferring funds to be spent on our our system, it can't be spent on their roads. That, that was the issue mainly is they're looking for funds for city streets and this is not what this is about. So you didn't hear any objections to what we're proposing here today? No. Okay. Do I need to still ask three times for? You do um, in conducting the public hearing. It's just a little odd with yeah. the situation yeah. at hand, but that's why I wanted just to explain how it is we made sure that we were contacting those that have interest in this and, and, and receiving And they were comment. notified they could access by WebEx? Uh, we didn't have any. Okay. We've done this several times in the past, so I, I think mm -hmm. a number of them know what's going on. Yep. All right. Well, is there anyone here to speak in favor or against this proposal? Anyone here to speak in favor or against? Third and last time, anyone here speak in favor or against? I hereby close the public hearing. Gentlemen, did I get a motion and a second? 
Mr. Chairman, just, the, the resolution that was in your packet has a little bit of a change on the last, now therefore be it resolved. Uh, the way we are proposing it to read is now therefore be it resolved that the Commissioner of Transportation be and is hereby requested to authorize transfer of all municipal construction funds to the regular construction account. Very good. Gentlemen, a uh, motion and second to approve as amended. I'll make that motion. Motion made by Commissioner Wilson. I'll second it for further discussion. Second by Commissioner Jelinski for further discussion. Any discussion? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Steve, could I just ask a question? Give me a negative. Um, I think so I've heard positives mm -hmm. from you. Throw out a negative. What, why would anyone be against this type of activity? Um, there, there are counties where the county board and the city council may be arguing about a project that needs to get done within a municipality on the design of it and how, uh, how it's all going to be paid for. And typically that would be an objection they'd make when you're trying to transfer these funds that would normally be spent on a project like that. Okay. We don't have that situation. Okay, fair enough. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, this is a roll call. Commissioner Wincher? Aye. Commissioner Jelinski? Aye. Commissioner Blaine? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Myself? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to interrupt you once, Steve. We got a little technical difficulty. We're going to wait until we move to the next item. It's not live streaming right now, and so we're trying to figure out what's going on. I don't mind. Technology, right? Technology. No. <laughs> Good thing I don't have to fix it. What's hard is, what's hard is slowing things down. The technology. I suppose we'll well, there is no conversation. Hard to think. I don't get that. No public so, hearing. Yeah. Yep. I don't. He's not even going to be here. I don't think. We talk about mm -hmm. internet connections. I missed two different persons second on that. Also. I I made the motion and uh, Commissioner uh, Jelinski. Jelinski, so you just quit and I couldn't make it. Up. About 10 minutes to 10, oh, yeah. and I was done. I couldn't connect to nothing. You from up there because where you were? Or yeah, I'm sure it's me. I, from my house, I'm sure that's just, yeah. It's actually so bad. Did you uh, listen to the board of adjustment? Yeah, yeah I did. I don't I believe you. Can't see the pretty what faces. Is, who's working on what, what road or man, nonstop, like a train of semis hauling? Oh, the contractor? What contractor? Um, well, a lot of the semis that I seen was uh, Kowalczyk. Okay, they must be hauling for a township, probably. Hauling gravel for a township. Okay. Yeah, they're heading, they're going east. But um, yeah, man, they're. But then I didn't see anybody today, but yesterday, the man, it's nonstop. It was like, no. Just go out to the landfill. an email last night, I think. Okay. So I, I Are they loading out of there? Oh, they yeah. They working last yeah. night. Yeah. Knife oh, is oh, running oh, out of there for oh, our oh, Casal 34. Yeah. Oh. So I fired yeah, that up. Bigger hole too. And, uh, yeah. And then we have our contractor going. We, Jeff, you'll be happy to see the hole out there. It looks yeah, like. I'm not too big on that. <laughs> We take a picture of it. <laughs> the gravel plant is that being used? We're still waiting for a permit. From who? The county? <laughs> well, the EAW is what really. Oh, you have to do an EAW up. on that. Huh? We did, and oh. so it, it, it's very close. Next coming up. Okay. What's his name? So things are things are moving along at the landfill. Yes. Yep. Yes. Everything is moving right along. We're in pretty good position. Are you getting coffee, Commissioner?
sure. Yes, would you like some? I'll come follow you. As long as it's been a, actually a really nice spring for us. Been nice Finally spring. dried out a little bit. Yeah, it's been a nice well, spring it's for. Perfect for it. That's but it evidently is still wet. If yeah. wherever I mean, I have that piece of corn on the farm across the road that we didn't get off last fall. You can't drive in there from here to the back of the room without falling in. I mean, that if it doesn't get sun and doesn't get yeah. air, yeah. and guys told me it's the same way in the woods. You go in the woods, you better be careful where you're going because you'll fall in. You'll they'll come and dig into China to find you. Yeah, they're really wet. I know. I see people pull in and then too. Yeah. So it'll be, but the fields. Otherwise, I mean, everything else has been. Really good. I mean, oh, that's what I told her. So you got to tell us we're supposed to test it. I, there's a cable unplugged. See that Travis, Travis, exactly. that we were talking about. Couldn't he go down the road if he can get signatures that more than half the people want? Can we? Put it back on? Let me turn. Because that's how we took it.
every day. And we are back up, gentlemen. Sorry about that. The live streaming should be working now. So. All right, we apologize for the technical difficulties. Thank you, IT department. Yes, thank you. I'll we'll continue with public works. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, also for your consideration is a reissuance of our maintenance <coughs> agreement with Crow Wing County. Um, we, we have just under four miles of road that we share with Crow Wing County along that border. Um, just north of Harding, you go straight north out of Harding, we have uh, our county stated Highway 23 where we have two miles of gravel uh, to the west and um, one mile of pavement to the east and then it comes south and ties back into our CASA 51. So there's three miles along that segment and then CASA 51 actually, that county state aid highway, as you go to the east, it follows for just under a mile on the border between Morrison and Crow Wing. And so what this spells out is who's responsible for which segments for maintenance, how we track that and how we bill Crow Wing County and how they bill us. Uh, we'd recommend that the board would authorize the agreement. So, and it's the same agreement we're operating under now. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Winters, second by Commissioner Wilson. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Have a good day. Thank you, you so much. You did the same, Mr. Steve. Wilson. Thank you. Next on the agenda is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month Pro Proclamation. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Commissioners, I have uh, Penny Pesta here from our agency and uh, Julie Newman, who is a supervisor of Productive Alternatives, which is a employment provider for the disabled here in Morrison County and a number of other counties, I think 12 or 14 or 18 now. So they're going to read the proclamation. Uh, we actually have two proclamations, and Emily will be here for one. So if you want to try to do a picture before or after. Okay, so. So Julie is going to read this proclamation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Julie. Whereas mental illness are medical conditions that disrupt a person's thinking, feeling, mood, ability to relate to others in daily functioning, just as diabetes is a disorder of the pancreas, mental illness are medical conditions that often result in a diminished capacity for coping with the ordinary demands of life. And whereas mental illness can affect persons of any age, race, religion, or income, mental illness are not the result of personal weakness, lack of character, or poor upbringing. And whereas without treatment, the consequences of mental illness for the individual and society are astounding, including unemployment, substance abuse, homelessness, inappropriate incarceration, isolation, or even death. And whereas stigma, negative stereotyping, and prejudices erode the confidence that mental disorders are real, treatable health conditions, thus impeding a person in getting the help they need and impose attitudinal, structural, and financial barriers to effective treatment and recovery. And whereas early identification and treatment is of vital importance by ensuring access to the treatment and recovery supports that are proven effective Recovery is accelerated and the further harm related to the course of illness is minimized. And whereas mental illness are treatable with appropriate effective medication and a wide range of services tailored to their needs, most people who live with serious mental illness can significantly reduce the impact of their illness and find a satisfying measure of achievement and independence. Thank you. Gentlemen? I'll move on this, Mr. Chair. Motion by Commissioner Jelinski. Second. Second by Commissioner Blaine. Discussion? I just want to thank you for all the work you do because, you know, especially in the times we are right now, mental health is uh, when people have been locked up and they can't do what they normally do, it takes a challenge to them. So, uh, with the businesses and everything, so thank you very much. Just one thing I want to let you know that we're going to do for Mental Health Month. Penny and her staff have worked on putting, they're going to put out signs. I think that all the schools have agreed to put signs in their areas. Uh, some providers have put, uh, are putting signs up. I'm not sure what they say, but maybe you can just say what they might indicate. 
Sure, we have 50 signs that we're gonna put out and distribute throughout the county at schools, at local businesses and providers. Um, on the front, it just talks about mental health awareness and things to watch for, and on the back of the sign, it has all of the different um, crisis numbers and resource information. Now, I would just like to finish the proclamation. We, the commissioners of Morrison County, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2020 to the Mental Health Awareness Month in Morrison County and urge all citizens to work together to break the stigma of mental illness and provide our support to those suffering and recovering from mental illness. Any further discussion, gentlemen? Mr. Chair? Yes. If I may, I'd just like to add, it takes special people to do what you're doing and anyone that has ever dealt with anyone in a crisis of a, of a mental health crisis um, knows exactly what I'm talking about. So thank you so very, very kindly for what you do. Appreciate that a lot. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Penny. Commissioner Blaine. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. And, and uh, thank you, ladies. And, and uh, thank you in this proclamation and, and for this proclamation in the, that we focus on um, things that uh, we can do and that uh, these individuals can do. Uh, rather than um, looking at uh, uh, things that people are not able to do. Um, I think that's a very important part of uh, this proclamation, and I'm glad that you're both here this morning. And if I may, Mr. Chair, um, the mental illness is kind of something that you can't see walking down the you know, road or in your car. This is something, again, that I a very strong advocate of, of as far as... Uh, taking care of these people and diagnosing them. I and we got them in the sheriff's department. We got them uh, throughout the whole county. So again, thank you for the work that you do. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. And now Emily's going to proclaim this as emergency management week, I believe, or next week. Medical service. Medical service. Close. All right. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Emily. Emily. A proclamation by the Morrison County Public Safety Group to designate the week of May 17th through the 23rd, 2020 as Emergency Medical Services Week. Whereas emergency medical services are a vital public service and the members of emergency medical services teams are ready to provide life-saving care for those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And access to quality emergency medical care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rate of those who experience sudden illness or injury. Emergency medical services has grown to fill a gap of providing important out-of-hospital care, including preventative medicine, follow-up care, and access to telemedicine and. Emergency medical services system consists of first responders, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, dispatchers, firefighters, law enforcement officers, public health emergency preparedness coordinators, emergency nurses, physicians, trained members of the public, and other medical care providers, and the emergency medical services teams, whether career or volunteer, engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continued education to enhance their life-saving skills, and it is appropriate to recognize the value and the accomplishments of emergency medical services providers by designating Emergency Medical Services Week. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Board of Morrison County Commissioners of the great state of Minnesota, in recognition of this event, do hereby proclaim the week of May 17th through the 23rd, 2020, Emergency Medical Services Week in Morrison County. And we call this observance to the attention of all of our citizens and encourage the community to show appreciation. So moved, Your Honor. Motion by Commissioner Wincher. Your Honor. Your Honor. <laughs> I'm sorry, was that Jeff? Your Honor. Second by Commissioner Jelinski. Discussion? If I may, again, the, the, all these uh, proclamations that we're doing here and resolutions, this is just something that is unseen throughout the county. And again, I appreciate everyone here at the county, uh, all the extra work that we do. And again, this is something that you're kind of hidden back in the background, but yet you're doing a great service to the county. So thank you. Commissioner Jelinski? Mr. Chair, if I may, Emily, thank you, first of all. Thank you very kindly. Um, I've been involved in this for way too many years, um, so I'm not going to start counting them. And I can't speak highly enough for everybody that's involved in this and everybody from the top down. And there is no top as far as I'm concerned, and there is no down. 
everybody's got an equal say in this whole in this whole thing. But the bottom line to emergency medical services week, if you will, EMS week, is folks, until you need one of these people, you have no idea how important this game is played. I mean, we just had a resolution on mental health. I get it. It's the same umbrella, and we all are in the same world. But until you need services like this, you have just no idea who the people are that we can go to. So thank you very, very much. And I, too, just think these times that we're living in with emergency medical services, a lot of times now these responders really don't know what they're responding to. Um, so I'm sure there's an added level of stress for those uh, emergency service workers now. And so it's really good to appreciate them during this very difficult time. Ms. Gruber? I was going to kind of say the same thing. I don't know that everybody realizes, and even the board necessarily realizes, that we meet on, we meet on a weekly basis with our emergency operations center. And Emily, being that public health component and that preparedness coordinator, she does an excellent job of keeping us on task, making sure all of the different agenda items are addressed, all of the different service areas that we're contacting um, and updated on and make sure people have what they need. So her role right now is at its peak and, and busy and you've really helped Morrison County be in a better place because of that. And so I just, you're here and you're here for a reason because we really appreciate what you do and the fact that you are coordinating this in a time that, you know, we can really see why you do what you do and it's neat. So thank you for being good at it too. Thank you so much, yep. Emily. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Uh, you. Gentlemen, we had a first and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Motion carried. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Next up before us, social services report. Good Brad morning. And Penny. Good morning. Good welcome. Morning Good morning. All right, so I did ask Penny to put together just a little bit of a, a mental health report uh, on adult mental health services, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Penny. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Um, so I just have a few statistics. I am not going in depth today. Um, we know that mental health is significantly impacted by where we're at today, causing a lot of added stress and anxiety um, for many different reasons, whether it's health, financial, employment. Um, all of those things are going to contribute to a person's mental health. Um, so we know that our, our day today looks a lot different than it would even three months ago when I started this report. Um, so just a few statistics for you on the first page. Just looking back at uh, Morrison County provides adult mental health case management for individuals who meet a serious and persistent mental illness status. Um, our caseloads um, have stayed pretty consistent over the last couple of years. You can see though the orange line um, are new cases that we opened and gray are the ones that have closed. That's good. We don't want people to stay on case management forever. We want to get them connected to services that can help them manage their symptoms and move on with their life in a very functional and satisfying way. Um, the yellow line that you see, um, especially under 2019, that shows the number of people underneath our jail social worker. Those people don't open necessarily to full-time case management, but are in, are being touched by our jail social worker. Can I interrupt you for one second on that issue? Yep. What if we didn't have that jail social worker? Then they <coughs> would be left to their own devices after release um, to come down to our office and apply for adult mental health case management and okay. or any other mental health services that that social worker is currently providing and doing for them. Very good. Thank you. So we do currently have 17 individuals are, who are on a civil commitment um, as well. The next slide shows you the revenue generated to Morrison County for adult mental health case management. Um, you can see there's a pretty significant increase in 2019 and there is a number of different factors that kind of go into that. Um, one of the factors is our dual mental health waiver case manager. Um, previously, we were only capturing revenue for the waiver portion of that work, and we had piloted this position and are now capturing also the TCM, mental health TCM revenue. Um, secondly, we have some increased 
individuals going on to a health plan where we get the full per diem rate instead of MA is only a partial half of the TCM rate. So that's going to increase our revenue as well as the jail social work position um, can generate some of our grant dollars for the time that they put into mental health type case management. And I, I would just like to say Penny and her staff have done a good job in accessing revenue, uh, the revenue available to those clients and making sure that the TCM rates are captured, the contacts happen. Uh, it's, it's a critical need to make sure we get reimbursed for these services. Thank you. I think it's important to show that um, at the bottom of that previous slide, the TCM rates there are identified. And you can see our TCM rate for 2020 is significantly higher. Um, and that has to do with managing um, a whole calculation, but a lot about the, the caseloads that the case managers are um, having the number that they have. The higher the number of their cases, the lower the TCM rate. So, Mr. Good. Chair? Yes, sir. If I may, Penny, where does that money come from? <clears throat> um, state and um, the health plans will do that TCM. Okay, okay. It's called targeted case management, okay. so yes, it's an, a Very medical good. assistance benefit. Very good, thank you. Um, the next slide shows our CSP grant, and this is a state grant that we get that um, I have applied for, and county, all counties apply for. Uh, it's a two-year grant. We were awarded <coughs> 659000 for the grant period of 2019 and 2020. I will be submitting the new grant request um, by July 1 of this year for our 2021-2022. You can see how it has broke down, um, how we have utilized these funds for community education and pre um, prevention, some transportation. Um, CSP services and drop-in center, that budget is pretty high. This is for anybody who does not have MA, cannot get armed services. That is where a person comes in and helps them one-on-one -on -one um, implementing the skills that they are being taught and encouraged to use by their therapist. An arms worker will come in and work those in real life, in real practice, and people who don't have MA don't have access to that service at all. Um, so part of our CSP dollars is used directly for that, for the people who are uninsured. Um, I wanna say we have over 20 people that we serve and someone comes in every single week, maybe multiple times a week, to support them. Um, supported employment is a little bit um, of funding in that area um, and then as, as well that case management and this is the area for anybody who is uninsured we don't get the TCM the MA rate or health plan as well as our jail social work position to fund that staffing time currently we're at about 51% at 63% of the grant period, so we are slightly underspent at this time. Um, but overall, uh, the services have been utilized well across and meeting needs of our residents in Morrison County. Any questions in that area? Um, I put together just a little bit of information about COVID-19 and mental health and what that looks like. I pulled off of the um, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Health, off of um, their information, really how um, you can help to reduce some of that stress and anxiety and worry that is being produced um, by this pandemic. Um, really managing how you are consuming information is important for people. That if you are watching information that is making you very, very upset, um, and or non-reliable, really monitor how you're managing that information coming in, making sure that you're following daily routines as much as possible, taking care of yourself through exercise and movement, practicing relaxation in the present moment, doing meaningful things with your free time, staying connected with others and maintaining your social networks. We know that this looks different, but we also know how vital it is to people to maintain human and social connections. It is mm -hmm. imperative for people's mental well-being to maintain those connections however possible. Uh, 
Um, one of the things that we've done here at Morrison <coughs> County is we have taken and we have contacted every last person that is receiving case management from us and we said, we want to be here for you. We want to know how often you need us to contact you so that we can support you in the way that you need. And you'll see here in this next graph is a breakdown um, from them on monthly is typical. That is what case managers are expected to do. But we have 20% of the people that we're providing case management to that want us to contact them at least weekly, every single week, to help support and sustain them. So our case managers are doing that. Um, and then 15% are contacting every other week. Most of this contact is shifted to phone and video, but we do still have case managers going out and meeting with people face to face. They carry a lawn chair in their trunk of their car and they bring it out and they sit outside with individuals. And that's really important for some people. We maintain all of the CDC social distancing and recommendations that are required, um, but we're still meeting with people. Mr. Chair, if, if I may, I just wanna say again, until somebody needs that type of service, nobody understands what it is. When we have people, whomever they may be, and Penny, you might be one of them, whomever they may be, that actually goes to someone's home, brings a lawn chair, sits outside, maintaining social distance, and communicates with people, and I'm just gonna say it, in need, until you've been there, you have no idea. Thank you. So um, the state and federal authorities have, uh, um, as you all I'm sure are aware, have authorized for us and all services, all the whole array of mental health services have been authorized to provide this service via phone and video. And, and that's essential because at least phone or video is still a service versus none. Having someone with a serious mental illness or serious and persistent mental illness at home without any contact completely isolated, I would be very worried about mm -hmm. their health and safety. So I am glad to see that the state and federal government has pushed forward. We continue to support our providers who we know are challenged by this time in having their staff engaged in providing the services to individuals who need them. Um, the last thing I had on here was a new um, virtual peer support network um, that is facilitated by Wellness in the Woods and funded by our Region 5 Adult Mental Health Initiative. Um, <coughs> this is available to anybody that wants it. You can go out to um, the county Facebook page. It got posted on there, I believe, for individuals to be able to access. Um, or you can always go into our Region 5 Mental Health web page to access any mental health or other services and supports at that web page. So just one comment on the flexibility that the state and federal government has allowed us in terms of most of our services being video or telephone. Um, that is as a result of our governor's executive emergency peacetime declaration, which technically ends tomorrow. So if that's not extended, we could be in a pinch. Um, uh, I know the legislature is working on even though the uh, peacetime declaration isn't in effect that they may try to extend these through legislative action, but I don't think there's been agreement on that yet. <clears throat> and of course, we don't know if the governor is going to extend that declaration beyond tomorrow. Uh, I kind of anticipate that he probably will go till June 13th, but um, that's when he can legally still do it. Um, if it goes beyond June 13th, he'd have to call the legislature back in session. But um, so we'll see. Hopefully, it will continue to be extended and we'll have that flexibility to do most of our services via phone or video, um, instead of just uh, having everybody do face-to-face -face again, so. Gentlemen, any questions? I just wanna say thank you for everything you and your staff doing for going up above and beyond what's necessary to help these people out. It's, it's very noble. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right, I'm gonna have Bonnie come up here for the next uh, report, and this is an action item. Um, uh, we were at planning last week to talk about our out-of-home placement fee schedule. Um, the same information is in your packet that we went through on Tuesday. And again, we, we are able to create fees for kids in out-of-home placement or to parents of kids in out-of-home placement uh, under Minnesota statute. 
And so we were trying to figure out a way to make this fair and not continue to um, uh, put these people in more uh, poverty. We probably know that most of our kids in placement already have uh, lower income and on uh, financial assistance programs. So we do not want to uh, create hardships for families as they try to get their kids back. Um, and so Bonnie's going to go through a little bit of information. Uh, we do actually have all four of the scenarios in your packet. I, I know they're not as easy to read. Um, and so I don't believe we actually created paper copies for you this time, so I apologize for that. Um, but they are in there. And so I'll just have Bonnie talk again a little bit more about the, the, what the difference is in our current fee schedule versus our new fee schedule. Good morning, Bonnie. Good morning. Good morning, Bonnie. Okay, so I'll just start with the examples. We are looking at changing the way we determine the amount of income available to a family to assess a fee. Right now, if we use the current system, what's in place results in fees that are not payable, really. So what we want to do is dis decide to take the federal poverty guideline amount for either one adult or two adult, depending on if both parents are in the home, and take that right off the top. So we at least are allowing families to have a certain amount of money to try to maintain their home for when the child or children return. So that makes a huge difference in the monies that we would be assessing for the families. Um, right now a family, example A, a family of five that earns $3,000 a month gross, so we're not even taking into account taxes there yet. So um, if we take off the federal poverty guideline amount for that, it results in a $100 a month payment. Whereas currently they would be charged $1,109 a month for those same services. It's been shown within the child support system that if we set a more payable fee, parents are more likely to pay and be more interactive with their children. It actually has shown also that um, families, sorry, <laughs> families um, that have payments are engaged so it's a big deal to try to make this step to setting a more realistic fee for people mr. chair mr. Jelinski Bonnie if, as I recall all we talked about last week was that in reality the vast majority of this never gets paid Correct. I mean it just goes on forever it just never gets paid but as we spoke and as we spoke today about mental illness or mental health if you will if we can make sense of finances here and, and make something given to a client that is actually within reach, that not only does the fact of they're paying, which they're not making it any, today, right. that they are actually paying something, but what it's also doing, I'm anticipating, and I'm going to guess you've got um, numbers that can show this, is that the mental health piece to those people, uh, individuals, whomever they may be, and let's face the music, it could be any one of us, is that it just makes their mental health that much more positive. Exactly. And I mean, if I got a bill tomorrow for $1,109 a month, I wouldn't know how to prepare yeah. to pay that. And these are already our families that are in need of our services and, and having somebody say to you that you're going to pay $1,109 a month? How? Where? So I, it does play into the mental health of the family and preparing the home for the child's return, which is what everybody wants and what the goal is. So hopefully by setting some realistic numbers, we can, we can do that. It actually has been shown too that um, when parents are required to pay these fees, that it's more likely the children will remain in the placement longer. Sure. So thank you. Sorry for the interruption, but thank no. you very much. And again, I, you know, I mean, the goal is to have some accountability for the parents because w the county is paying for the placement, uh, but we also want to make sure it's realistic. 
Um, we want to continue to engage that family in services. And as we've said, the stress, the mental health, the anxiety that a family's experiencing when a child is placed is already significant. Um, and so um, we felt trying to be a little more realistic uh, made sense, uh, both from an accountability, but also from a, uh, the ability for that family to maintain their home and hopefully work with us on returning the kids. So, I, so my, my request is to approve the, the new policy for kids in out-of-home placement um, that we have talked about. And again, the biggest change is that we now will take into consideration uh, the federal poverty guidelines as, uh, as we determine those fees. General, could I get a motion a second for further discussion? Mr. Chair, I'll make motion. motion second. Made, motion made by Commissioner Blaine, second by Commissioner Wincher. Any discussion? I just think, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Blaine. No. No, I, I, I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt you, I Mr. Chair, but no. uh, uh, I just want to say that there's two parts of this that are that are really important to me, and I'm glad that, that we kind of highlighted these again. We had this discussion at the planning meeting, but um, we are providing accountability to, to uh, I'll say, the taxpayers of, of Morrison County and the residents of Morrison County in, in, uh, in the work that's being done here. But I think more importantly, um, adjusting this fee schedule to, uh, to make sure that we recognize the fact that these families have to have uh, a, a significant amount of income or, a, or a, a, I'll say a regular amount of income to be able to, to have uh, sustenance it within, their, within their home. And, and, and we're trying to do everything we can to be able to bring back these, these uh, children back into the home um, to, to place the, um, uh, a fee payment above uh, uh, a, a level of, of uh, a revenue within the homestead to allow them um, to raise the children and and live and and and, and sustain, um, I, I think warrants us to take this action to to uh, to have this uh, fee schedule revisited. And and I I believe strongly that this is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for the families, for the individuals, and uh, and we will address the we will address the the revenue coming in. But we'll do this in a way that it's done um, with respect to the family. So, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Blaine. I just wanted to add a little bit to what Commissioner Blaine said that if the financial difficulty hinders um, reunification and they remain in placement longer, it's, this could possibly save us money in the long run, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Very That's good. the hope. Thank you for bringing this forward yes. to us. And uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it looks like it'll be a good deal, and uh, we appreciate it. Bonnie and Steve have done a lot of work, good work on this, and I appreciate it as well. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner thank you. Wincher? Um, if I just may, again, we discussed this last week where yes. if someone's on MA or something like that, this is totally different than that, where they would not qualify. And I'm sure there's people out there, while well, they're getting medical assistance, they're getting this free, this is free. This has nothing to do with that. And it may be, correct me if I'm wrong. That would be correct in the fact that if they're getting MA, that would be a 4E eligible fund and would be handled by the federal government and a fee collected by the state. So we're talking here about families that are above that threshold but well below the others. And would not, they affect their eligibility for MA, they probably still would not be eligible for medical assistance. So the family, the, the kids in placement automatically are eligible for medical assistance. Thank you. We got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Bonnie. Thank you, Brad. Um, I have one other thing on the social services side, and that is a, a letter we received from the Minnesota Department of Human Services uh, recognizing our fi uh, financial unit or our accounting unit in terms of perfect reporting to the Department of Human Services, which is important for Jim, Deb, and Linda, who are our accounting folks. Um, as well as the staff, it takes a lot of work to make sure all these reports on a quarterly basis are submitted to DHS. So it's always nice to get this letter. 
um, recognizing our staff for the good work that they have done on behalf of the Department of Human Services and Morrison County. Yeah, congratulations on that, Brad, and we thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, I have, I think, one public health uh, item, and that is a renewal for a 2 a.m. liquor license for Main Gate uh, Bar, and it has been approved by the sheriff. Gentlemen. Motion made by Commissioner Wilson, second by Commissioner Blaine. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Sorry, I was wrong. There are two seasonal licenses that we are uh, up uh, on. Of course, it's almost summer, so we have a couple of uh, ice cream places that are ready to open, the Dairy Treat uh, on the west side of Little Falls, and Silo Ice Cream in Motley are requesting seasonal establishment renewal licenses. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Jelinski, second by Commissioner Wincher. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. And then just a brief update. I will let you know that we are up to 16 uh, positive uh, COVID-19 individuals in Morrison County. Um, I do actually get the, I did get a list every night of those positive that they're no longer sending out lists. I have to go online and look. Now they have provided a, a website for me to go out and look. So I'm going out and looking about every night at seven o'clock to see what we have. And I'm notifying our uh, emergency operations group um, as well as the record uh, on those individuals. So awesome. we are still are not, we still are not a hot spot. Um, knock on wood, I've talked with the emergency department a couple times a week about how it's going over there. Um, they did actually start up elective surgeries yesterday, so they were planning to do that. And um, in my conversation with uh, the ER director, it sounds like they're feeling okay about it. I think the, the, the PPE equipment is still tenuous, but I think they're feeling okay with where they're at right now. So um, it's have, still an evolving situation for sure. Have they increased the testing then in Morrison County? They have, yes. Thank you for that question, Commissioner, Mr. Chair. Um, Yes, they are averaging about 15 a day now at the hospital and clinic, so they have significantly increased their testing capabilities. Great. Um, and they foresee that that should continue to increase, so there still are limits on who can be tested. You can't just walk up to get a test uh, at the clinic or at the hospital right now just to see if you have had it or are doing it. You still have to have some symptoms, but they're doing many more tests now, so. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair? Chair? Commissioner Jelinski. Excuse me, thank you. Brad, are you familiar at all? Is St. Cloud, Stearns County still considered a hotspot, or don't you know? It certainly looks that way. I've not talked with the public health director there for a couple weeks, but okay. uh, if you look at the rise in cases, um, they're certainly continuing to grow. Um, but, yeah, sure. it's... Very good. Commissioner Wilson? Uh, Brad, I think St. Gabriel's has a drive-up, too, where they test you, right? I don't believe so. I think you are either getting it from your physician or in the ER. I don't know that they're doing drive up, but I, I guess I won't say for certain, but I've not heard that. I thought I heard that on the news today or yesterday that oh. they were doing drive up out and, front. But yep. And they might whatever. be. Yep. This, the second question I got for you back to liquor license, are we doing anything to help these bar owners and stuff with liquor license? Are they due to pay them on time? and? Since they're not open, I've had that question from a few of them. Yep, we, we sent out um, the liquor license uh, letters, and the commissioners allowed us to use the, not, use the reduced rate, irregardless of whether or not they are doing the uh, responsible beverage server oh, training. Right, right. And I've had a couple questions from establishments and, and special events, and what I've indicated is that if they pay, pay late, that we're not going to charge any... Um, late fees because I some are, are they're working with us on when when they're going to reopen and so they're still okay. thinking about that so okay thank you if, if it's a conversation the commissioners would like to have about further um, further uh, reduction in liquor, liquor license fees or something like that we certainly could entertain that <coughs> conversation um, I could talk with the environmental health staff or um, I would lead up the commissioners to see if we'd like to have some more conversation about liquor license fees. Mr. Chair, Brad, when are they due? July 1st. Okay, that is. I was thinking yeah. it was an annual. Um, it is annual and, July I thought it was the 1st. calendar yeah. year, though, is what I was thinking. It's a, yeah. So the letters have gone out. Um, and as I said, establishments are keeping in touch with us about uh, where they're at and, and, and uh, when they're, when they're going to reopen. So, Commissioner Wincher? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, going back to this virus, 
you know, personally, you know, I would like, or maybe they do this, you know, are these uh, ones that are, have been uh, diagnosed with the virus, are they uh, hospitalized or are they stay, you know, are, you know, again, myself personally, I don't care to know their name, I don't care where they work or anything like that. I would just like to know what, you know, what's happening. Are they, you know, is that severe cases and stuff? Do they give that information to you? Um, they do. It is not necessarily timely on the day that we get the information on the person. However, the 16 individuals that have tested positive in Morrison County have not needed a hospitalization. I do know that um, at this point. Not okay. to say um, the uh, condition couldn't change, but at this point, um, they have not needed a hospitalization. And in my conversations with the hospital, they have not had individuals who are in the hospital as a result of COVID-19. And again, my personal, this is my personal view, you know, the more people they test, I mean, we could have that. We don't even know it. But again, if there's some that triggers this here, and, you know, another story is that, you know, I'm, we got to open up these, uh, the county for these businesses, like the bars, the uh, restaurants, clothing stores. Again, it's so unfair what's happening here. That I'm going to get political now. Maybe one, one person's making this whole decision for, all of Minnesota being, I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think going back to the testing and the number of positives, again, I think it's important to look at the percentage of positives based on the number of tests is kind of that critical percentage. However, on a call with the, the Commissioner of Health last week, we're not entirely certain all of the testing facilities are giving us all the negatives. So the percentage might not be exactly correct, but I think watching that percentage of positives versus tests are, are kind of that percentage is important. So um, just one other update, if I may. Again, we're doing a produce drop this week. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Deb has sent out an invitation to all the employees to help and support this. And I just wanted to let you know that for this round, we're going to be serving 723 households. We actually increased the number of seniors by just over 100 for this particular po produce drop. We're at 614 seniors, 1,302 adults and 590 kids. So we are serving um, just a few less uh, than we did uh, two weeks ago. And I would say people were respecting the request that if you have gotten a produce box last time, or you may have visited the food shelf in the last 30 days, allow some others to, to take advantage of this. And that has happened. We did open it up a little bit more on Friday and Monday. So we, uh, we did increase that number. Um, but again, we're pleased to offer the service and, it, and it's gone very well and knock on wood the net, this delivery has not happened yet but um, but uh, I've been pleased with just the how the staff have managed and organized this it's been a, it's been a, a joy to watch and I know some of the people who did the deliveries were able to see the uh, the appreciation on on fo from folks as they dropped off their produce so thank you commissioners for allowing us as a county to be able to do this thank you for doing it and if I may, last time we did this was Thursday or Friday or any of my time goes by fast. And it was well organized then, and I'm sure it'll be a lot more well organized this time. We have certainly learned lessons, and like I said, I think I let the board know that of the 800 households, we missed six. And when you're talking about putting together this in a week, never having done it before, last time, I think that's a testament to the, to the staff. And the, so yeah, It's been fun to work on. Thank you for supporting it. So that's all I have this morning. All right, well, thanks all so right, much. Thank you, Brad. Commissioners. Thank you, Gentlemen, we're going to take a five-minute break before Perfect. we have land services. Outstanding.
Did you get my list of stuff? Yeah, sorry. Gentlemen, we'll bring the Morse County Board of Commissioners back, meeting back to order. Next up on the agenda is Land Services Report. Amy? Morning. Morning, Morning Amy. Morning. Morning, Amy. Morning, Amy. All right, I have a few things for you today. Yes. Okay, the first one uh, is to formally approve Morrison County's participation in the Next Generation E911 GIS grant. We had visited about this at a planning session that some grant money was available for reimbursement of our GIS expenses, uh, getting our data ready for the Next Gen 911. Uh, and now that grant program is requesting formal approval by the county board to accept those grant funds. Um, we are, we are part of um, the Central Minnesota Emergency Services Board, and um, the region is receiving uh, a little over $600,000 in grant reimbursement. Morrison County's share of that um, is up to $28,188, and so that's what we can recoup through this grant. So I'm just looking for a, a, a motion and a second to show um, uh, acceptance of those grant funds to show in the minutes. Gentlemen. Mr. Chair, I'll move on this. Motion by Commissioner Jelinski, second by. I'll second. Commissioner Wilson, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carried. All right, thank you. Uh, the next item is to consider the interim use permit request uh, for Harvey and Jean Shoon. And this is to establish a limited rural business, uh, specifically a retail agricultural market. Uh, this was recommended for approval by the Planning Commission at their last meeting with one condition, and that condition is that the interim use permit shall terminate when Harvey and Jean Shun no longer own the business detailed within the permit. I'll make that motion with the condition added. I'll second that. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. All right. Then the third item, I do have the applicant here. So Jeff, if you want to come on up and have a seat, please. Um, this is to consider the conditional use permit uh, request from Jeff Hardy. And this is to establish a commercial planned unit development, specifically a resort. Uh, and this was also uh, recommended for approval by the Planning Commission with 13 conditions. Uh, and then I'm gonna go through those conditions with you. Uh, the first is to abide by local and state law, maintain a set of resort rules that addresses, at a minimum, quiet time, emergency and storm procedures, firewood, fireworks and pets. Rules must be provided to customers at check-in. Solid waste must be removed by a licensed solid waste hauler and prohibition of burning of garbage within fire rings. Maintain a current certificate of compliance for the septic system serving the campground. Tenants' placement of structures requiring a land use permit, such as storage buildings and decks, must obtain the necessary permits from the Land Services Department. All watercraft utilized on Lake Lena by the resort patrons shall be owned by the resort. Only one motorized watercraft is allowed to be utilized on Lake Lena by resort patrons, and the boat motor shall not exceed 25 horsepower. No ATV shall be brought on site or utilized by resort patrons. One dock shall be allowed to serve the resort. The site must maintain, must remain in compliance with the SWIP, uh, including future roads, trails, and developed sites. Future impacts shall occur well outside of wetland areas and water holding areas identified within the SWIP to ensure future conflicts do not occur, regardless of dry or wet weather cycle. The resort owner shall educate campers on aquatic and terrestrial invasive species and actively promote behavior modification to prevent the spread of invasive species to Lake Lena, as well as surrounding bodies of water and forest. And the clearing or injuring of red oak trees shall not occur between the months of April and July for the purposes of preventing oak wilt. Um, I do wanna add, I did receive an email from Shannon Wettstein this morning in regard to a conversation that she had with Mr. Hardy, um, and I'd just like to share that with you. Um, and the email is, I talked with Jeff this morning about the condition that is on his property to refrain from cutting oak trees. 
I would be supportive of this being amended so it says he must work with the local DNR forestry office before any cutting of oak trees on the property to ensure he is using best management practices for limiting his spread of invasive species. So that is something um, for your consideration. Could you identify who Shannon Wettstein is? Shannon Wettstein is the district manager for the Morrison County Soil and Water Conservation District. Thank you. And the oak wilt condition was a recommendation from her um, at the hearing. And she was okay with amending number 13, that's, with the new language that you just provided? Yes, that's correct. And I think that <clears throat> Mr. Hardy is asking for consideration for amending that um, condition. Gentlemen, could I get a motion and a second for further discussion? So moved, Mr. Chair. Motion made by Commissioner Blaine. Second. Second by Commissioner Wilson for further discussion. Any discussion? <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Commissioner uh, Blaine. Uh, if I may, uh, in the uh, in my motion, um, uh, we will um, consider that uh, that language from from uh, Shannon as uh, replacing the language listed um, in number thirteen. Okay, is that good for you, with you, Mr. Commissioner Wilson, for yes. further discussion? Yes, yes, okay. yes. And if I and if I may ask a question, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Blaine. Um, uh, Amy or, or uh, Mr. Hardy, um, on number um, on uh, number seven, uh, uh, condition number seven, uh, requiring uh, uh, only one boat motor um, on the uh, uh, on the premises there, um, not to exceed 25 horse. I was just curious, and I and I know there was discussion, and and this was a a very lengthy planning commission meeting, and that. Very much stating the obvious, but um, uh, with the uh, with the, all this being handled online and that, uh, I just wanted to to uh, ask: Is there right now on Lake Lena uh, a restriction on boat motors and or sizes for anyone else that would that would uh, enter that water body? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Blaine, the there are some landowners that have uh, pontoons and motors. I'm not sure that there is a restriction. Um, I did receive comments from some of the local people that thought 25 horse was excessive, and I'm willing to put a 10 horse motor on it. Um, 25 horse is just what we currently have at the resort. It is a larger lake, um, so given the size of the lake, I'm willing to go to a 10 horse or a 15 horse, something smaller. Mr. Chair, if I may, and, and, and uh, Mr. Hardy, I, um, I, I don't want you to be confused. I'm not, uh, I'm not asking for, uh, I'm not asking for you to, to throttle down that, the size of the uh, engine you would have on your pontoon. Um, you know, I was just curious, cause I, 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 in my notes, I did not have Clarification: Whether uh, the DNR or or Soil and Water or any other jurisdiction had uh, had placed a restriction on uh, uh, boat motors on Lake Lena or the uh, the maximum size of a boat motor, and so I'm just I want to make sure before we before we vote on anything here, whatever that were that we clarify. Um, because it w part of the reveal in the discussion um, during the public hearing what, was that there are other property owners who have boats or pontoons who have motors on them. And I know there was discussion that uh, at one point where, where individuals thought you should, not, you should not be allowed to have a motorized watercraft at, at uh, your resort. So... That's where I'm going with this, and that's what I'm trying to get to uh, to a clarification. Or is there a rule in place? And if not, um, can we get that stated, Mr. Chair? I I am not aware of of a restriction on Lake Lena in regard to no motor or maximum ho horsepower, and I was not informed by the DNR that there is any such regulation on Lake Lena. Uh, and so, I as far as I know. No, there is no restriction on that. However, it is a shallow lake, 
And so certainly um, the horsepower of motor, I think, is selected as self-limiting just because of that. Yeah. Because it is a very shallow lake. And so um, it's generally um, probably not practical to have large, large horsepower motors on that lake. Okay. So uh, Mr. Chair uh, and, and Amy, thank you f uh, that we got that clarified. Mr. Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Amy, if you may, again, I got a couple, and I'm sure the rest of the uh, commissioners did too, about that why the DNR did not mm -hmm. comment. And we got a message from the DNR. Could you read that for the record, what Mark Anderson, if you don't have it in front I of do. you? I can. If you can put that it. up there, because okay. again, I think this is very important for what we're moving forward here, whether we deny it or approve the, the permit. Certainly. Mark just sent it this morning. It says, if I may, yes. um, Tom and Morrison County Commissioners, in reviewing the campground plans with Morrison County, the application met all the requirements of the state of Minnesota shoreland re regulations and the Morrison County ordinance, which is consistent with state rules. Ultimately, this campground meets the applicable rules. The Morrison County Planning Commission recommending approval of the application is appropriate. Thank you for that. Commissioner Jelinski. Mr. Chair, if I may, I've got a couple questions also, Jeff, about your pontoon and about your motor. Very familiar with the pontoon. My anticipation is just a guess is that you're talking about a 20-foot pontoon. I'm just guessing that's what you're talking about. A 25 horsepower motor certainly is not too big for that, for that boat, for that piece of watercraft. Certainly a 10 horse will push it around. We're both very clear on that. Um, I did have a conversation with a property owner from up in that area, and that was one of her concerns was, oh, they're gonna be tearing around with boats at high speeds. And I said, well, I understand that, and I do. I understand the concern. However, I think that there's a positive that we have to remember that, that we have here. Should this permit go through, should you end up building the campground that you're talking about here, I think that having a watercraft, not two, not three, not a half a dozen, with a motor on it, but to have a watercraft with a motor on it is probably a big positive besides being a negative, and I hate to talk this way, because what I'm talking about is negativism, or things that happen to good people. Bad things happen sometimes on water. And very often it would be a very big, pos or big plus to have a watercraft with a motor to get from one place to the other. Um, I'm not going to get into how big should that motor be on that boat, but a motor versus an oar. I think that's a positive, and I think that that is forward thinking on your part. We're talking about boats. I'm very clear, and, and I have to apologize for this also, and I'm just going to get this out of the way. I think it was about 10 minutes to 10 when my Internet connection went poof. I understand this hearing went till about 10 minutes to 11. Gosh, I missed an hour. Well, I did, because I could not reconnect again. And that's part of the world we live in today. Sorry, but I did not get to hear the whole thing. But I was there until about 10 minutes to 10. I fully would support you as the resort owner, you and your boys, I believe, as the resort owner and owners, to have your watercraft there, period. And when I, talk, when I say period, I mean I'm going to come and I'm going to rent a piece of property from you for the year, for the day, for the whatever it is. I am not going to be allowed to bring a watercraft to your campground, period. Excuse me, not fair. I can bring a watercraft there, but I can't dock that watercraft at your campground. And I do not believe there's a public access on this lake. No. So if I know I'm renting from you, or I'm a camper, if you will, and I come with my 10-foot, 20-foot, 30-foot, whatever watercraft, it's hooked up to my truck, my vehicle, well, that's where it's got to stay while on that property because I cannot utilize it on, on your facility. I can also not utilize my 
plastic kayaks because if I'm understanding this whole thing correctly and with these conditions, the watercraft have to be owned by you. I just want to make sure that we get that very clear because there's been a lot of talk about uh, invasive species, and I get it, I understand, and that this small lake is going to be ruined as soon as we have anybody there because they're going to bring that. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding the whole thing correctly, that there will be one watercraft with a motor on it, not five watercrafts with a motor on it, but one. And i got to be honest with you, you're old enough and smart enough to know what kind of motor or what size motor is applicable. I don't know that anyone can answer this question, but I've heard that this lake is as shallow as five feet. I've heard that it's as deep as 13 feet. I don't know the answer to any of those questions, but I've heard that from several different people um, with um, emails or whatever that phone calls that I've received. It's too shallow to do anything. And, and maybe it is, I don't know. Um, I would like to have Amy explain in somewhat of a detail what an environmental lake really truly means. Natural environment lake, and that, that was um, actually something that we had made part of the record because we don't, we don't um, entertain a lot of permits on a natural environment lake. So the DNR classification for a natural environment lake um, is that they are generally small, often shallow lakes with limited capacities for assimilating the impacts of development and recreational use. They often have adjacent lands with substantial constraints for development such as high water tables, exposed bedrock, and unsuitable soils. So the DNR um, classifies each lake based on, on various parameters, and Lake Lena meets that because it's small, it is shallow, uh, and so it meets the definition or, or criteria to be designated as a natural environment lake. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, if I may continue. Absolutely. There, there's been a couple of questions that I've seen, maybe I also heard that night, I gotta tell you, I don't know, I don't remember all of it, uh, about people fishing. I don't know if anybody fishes this lake, period. Don't have a clue. But I've been told that birds eat the fish that are in this lake and that's how the birds survive and so on and so forth. And then I've also read that your policy would be, well, this is a catch and release lake. Come on, we're all old enough to know better than it doesn't always work that way. And who would enforce that? I don't know that. Um, would anybody have to fish? They're using your watercraft, I get that. And we're taking a tour of the lake, whatever we want to. But would anyone need to fish just because they're at the resort? Don't know that, I'm just, I'm just throwing that out. Also heard that there was gonna be a lot of excess car traffic on our county roads. Um, I didn't read anything from the county engineer that said we don't have roads that can handle uh, the amount of excess traffic, whatever that would be. Also heard a lot of concerns that the people that would be renting from you were going to ruin other lakes in the area because they can't go on the lake that, they've got, that you would have your proposed resort, that they would go to other lakes. I don't know that I or this board can prevent anyone from going on any lake, period. Don't have a clue of that. I just don't believe that we can do that, or I can't, anyway. Um, and I think that's all I've got. Thank you very kindly. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Wilson. Um, I've been to the Hardy's Resort where they're at now, and they do a wonderful job at taking care of a campground. I think a lot of the people are scared when they hear 160 campsites are coming into a place where there isn't campgrounds now. But I stay at a campground up in Garrison right across from Mille Lacs, and we have about 80 to 90 sites there. And now we're right across from Mille Lacs. There's probably only 10 that have boats that are probably used once or twice a year. And if there's more than half of the people there it's usually a holiday weekend, otherwise they're not. So I think that uh, when you hear 160, 
uh, people, I think that scares them. I'm glad that you don't have four wheelers because those are the ones that can kind of stir things up. Uh, I presume you'll have golf carts there and stuff if people want to drive them around. But uh, other people also need a place to go that can't afford a cabin and stuff. And I know the kind of uh, job you do, and I know that you will keep things in order. And um, I, I understand the concerns, but you guys have kind of talked about that. Most of the phone calls I got, they wanted to know about why the DNR didn't say something and they did this morning is because you met all the qualifications and you went through all the ropes to do it right. So I thank you. Amy, uh, Mr. Hardy has a campground in Fish Trap Lake. How many complaints have we gotten on that establishment? We have not received any complaints on that establishment over the time that I have been the zoning administrator. Okay. And Mr. Hardy, could you explain what kind of campground this is? Is this a weekend traffic or is, do you rent them out by the year or how, how does this work? Mr. Chairman, the resort will initially be set up with uh, a mix of seasonal and overnight camping sites um, over the course of time that may change and go more toward seasonal um, depending on the demand. I know uh, one resort owner over on Crow Wing Lake, he actually makes uh, about $1,500 a season more on his overnight camping as opposed to a seasonal, and that's why he's weighted heavier that way. But given our location as opposed to his, uh, seasonal would probably work better for us that way. Um, and if I may, I just have uh, a couple of more things to talk about in sure. relation to uh, Condition number eight here, it says no ATVs shall be brought on site. I would, if we could change that, uh, no ATVs shall be used on site because people will probably bring them in on trailers. They'll go to the Sioux line. They'll go up toward uh, uh, Pine River and, and ride that riding park there. So we would like to allow them to be brought in, just not unloaded off the trailers. Uh, yes. Should this be approved yes. and... Um, as far as this was a phased project, it still is, um, we would like the board to consider uh, allowing us to move phase three into phase one um, and putting in a pool the first year, this year, um, that would do a couple of things that would make the sites more marketable. It would also take uh, additional pressure off the lake uh, that the neighbors are concerned about. Amy, uh, those phased in projects, are them written on this form as, uh, as no, a rule? No, yeah, Mr. Or Chair, yeah, they're, you... not, they're not in concrete. It, it really was um, for, for, the, for the information um, to the Planning Commission and, and to the County Board as far as how the development progress of this would go. But if you grant a conditional use permit, you're, you're granting all permission to do all of those things and the timing of that is not specified so if if he wants to fast forward the installation of a pool that's not something that within your permit we're gonna we're gonna dictate the the timing of any of that sure. it's just that it's recognized that he's identified that a pool would be going in that was part of the conversation and so that would be allowed moving to be, forward it'd be a permitting process type exactly thing? Okay. yes mm -hmm. all right and then Commissioner Blaine, would you like to amend your motion to include the the use of the ATVs on the property as in, on how would you like to word eight. that? Condition number eight. No ATVs shall be brought on site or utilized by resort patrons. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you uh, for recognizing that. And and I would uh, amend my motion to include that. In the, and uh, I also want to, I, I'm, I want to make sure that we recognize too that the uh, the last four words in there of of number eight utilized by resort patrons it would that we recognize that because there was also discussion that that uh, Mr. Hardy and his staff uh, may have their own uh, uh, utility vehicles they need for for uh, servicing uh, the the residents there and and maintaining the work that. Uh, that they do, and we're, and that is allowed on uh, 
on that site. Mr. Chair? Yes, Amy. Would it make sense then to reword that um, to read, no ATVs shall be used on site by resort patrons? Yes, I agree. Thank you. Is that getting at what you'd like? Could you maybe put in there unloaded too? Because I know you're, I know we're getting picked and you know what with the chickens, but you know again if they're going to be unloaded there and maybe they're going to drive, you might have people getting upset. I don't know. Is that a possibility? That was, that would look in there. Certainly can. Is that the wish? I'm of just court? putting that out there. I don't know, you know if it's necessary or not. If if you can't use them, you shouldn't be able to use them. Would, would that be considered using them, unloading them, and Mr. driving them Mr. around Mr. your Chair, camper? Uh, commissioners, <laughs> um, you know, perhaps they have a utility trailer there. They brought their four-wheeler up. Um, they want to unload it and use their utility trailer to haul their golf cart in to get it worked on right. or something yes. like that. So, um, you know, if anybody is going to be running their ATVs throughout the resort, they'll be asked to leave. Yes. So, so I think uh, the way you had it stated, Amy, is sufficient. Okay. You know, I'll agree with that. Mike agrees with that. Commissioner Wincher? Yeah, and again, we've had all numerous about the additional boats. So are you going to be allowing, having room to have, if I have my 16-foot aluminum or whatever it is and I bring it there, are you going to have places to uh, just leave them or are they going to be required to stay uh, hooked up to their vehicles? How, how are we going to... Because again, people are saying, well, they're going to come to Lake Shamina or they're going to come to Fish Trap or whatever the lakes around there. So again, we know they can't dock them there. How are you going to handle that when somebody comes in there with boats? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Wincher, we would, uh, we would have a parking area for boats. Uh, it, they wouldn't be, you know, currently at our resort now, they're not allowed to be stored on site. We have a separate parking area for boats uh, just for safety and, and uh, less clutter. And that would be something that we would do at the proposed resort is have a separate, uh, about 30 acres of 112, 114 acres is being used. So there's plenty of area that those type of things could be stored away from sites. And where I'm going with this, you know, AIS, the Aquatic Invasive Species, People are talking about that. So, will they be? Will this be a storage close to the lake? Where so, if somebody wants to dump their wastewater, that it could go into the lake, or are you going to have some preventive for that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Wincher, uh, there won't be any parking that would, um, if their boat was full of water, would be able to reach the lake. Uh, we wouldn't. We wouldn't put. Uh, you know, to us, Lena is a huge asset as well, and. Yes. And we want it to stay right. pristine and nice, and uh, we wouldn't put that risk. And again, I was at his other camps, and it was run just excellent. And again, they do a great job as far as you know, taking care of their patrons, and you know, they're uh, following the rules of what are applied to them. So again, uh, moving forward, <coughs> I would, I'll be approving or not approving. I'll make them, not the motion, but I would agree to this permit. Commissioner Jelinski. Mr. Chair, thank you. Jeff, you don't have written in here and, and any of the conversation that I've been involved with. Are you intending on having a swimming beach here on this, on this lake? I got very, I'm very clear about the pool, support it, but are you intending on having a swimming beach? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Jelinski, um, we're not gonna stop people from wading in, in the lake, but as far as um, developing it into uh, type of sandy beach. We don't have any intentions of doing anything like that at this time. Okay. And then the other question that I've heard rumblings about is that, of course, there's going to be a cafe, probably a bar, and who knows else what's going to come here. I haven't read that. It's not part of the, it's not part of the, the topic that we're talking about, but I've been told that all of a sudden, miraculously, that's part of it also. It's not, is it? It is not. There's, there's no cafe, there's no restaurant, there's no bar attached to this that I haven't seen. Mr. Chair, there, there uh, also in the design of this, there isn't even like a clubhouse um, proposed where there's like a central gathering. There's some recreational areas like volleyball courts and pools yep. and, and, and things like that and a playground um, but, uh, and then the shower house. But there isn't any other... Um, building proposed that, that would serve 
as as a bar or a restaurant or anything else. And please be very clear, you're going to have an office, and I, I'm very clear on that, you have to have an office, that you perhaps are going to sell an ice cream cone or a bottle of pop. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about there's no intent here of there's not a restaurant that's going to pop up, a gas station, bar, all of a sudden on this property. It's not part of what we're talking about. I'm just talking out loud. So everybody can be very clear. That's not part of what we're talking about. No, and Mr. Chair, he'd need to come in for additional permitting if that was proposed. Yep. Anything else, gentlemen? Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, uh, Mr. Hardy, I, I, you know, I support what you do uh, in, in what your proposal uh, entails here and, and uh, I, for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, you know, I believe development up in that area uh, of, this, uh, of this sort is, uh, is good utilization. Um, uh, uh, of some of these resources and how you, you and your family and your business is approaching that um, uh, to me is admirable. Um, but I, I think this is, this is a good thing. This is good for the economy um, in, in, uh, in our Lincoln Lakes area up there too. And I think this is, this is a, uh, a good step forward um, uh, for Morrison County in uh, the undertaking that uh, that you're after, um, but I I'm, I also want to say I'm I'm uh, I'm glad that you um, and and your business looks at the uh, environmental aspect of that resource of of Lake Lena up there and and certainly it was. Um, shared with many of us at the uh, planning commission meeting um, by other residents in the uh, of the lake there the some of the natural beauty the wildlife the the uh, the plants and the in the lake itself um, there too um, i'm hoping that um, that your neighbors up there will um, will in time embrace um, the effort that you're about to uh, embark on um, here with uh, with your with your business development, but also be willing to um, uh, share in those um, experiences with uh, with the people that we're inviting to come up and be a part of Morrison County, whether it's for a day, a week, or a, or a season on there. That um, we are not going to um, put a basket over the candle, uh, uh, shall we say? But rather, we will uh, uh, bring forward uh, some of the the beauty spots of our county and be willing to share them um, with those who would like to come up uh, uh, and uh, and spend time in Morrison County. And we also recognize the fact that when we do have these people coming. Um, from wherever they're coming from, they will also be stopping, we know, on the way and buying gas or buying groceries or buying supplies. Um, and we hope they do that also within our confines in, in uh, Morrison County. Um, so I applaud you for your efforts um, and, and your families. And you have, you have uh, gone through the scrutiny and have have uh, jumped through the hoops and and um, I look forward to the vote on this, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Jelinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Amy, Jeff, I, just for the record, this is an allowed use very clearly in Morrison County's master plan, if you will, to be able to do exactly what you're doing. Yes, Mr. Chair, it is allowed. It wouldn't have come in front of you unless it was. Thank you. And I just want to make for this in particular case, I want to be very clear, I could have bought that property. Commissioner Wincher could have bought that property. Any one of your neighbors could have bought that property and quite honestly could have done the exact same thing or built a couple more houses or homes or whatever would have fit or done nothing or done nothing, or done nothing with it also. So um, it's an allowed use, it's there. 
quite honestly, you've got a proven track record. And you do. You've got a proven track record on fish trap. Um, it's good with me. And I just would like to add to it, it's, it's an economic benefit to Morrison County. We, uh, we encourage business growth, and, and this is one way to, I know Mr. Hardy probably don't like paying his taxes, but it's one way for us to collect more taxes to reduce the burden on others. Um, some of the uh, issues that were of concern to the residents, many of these he has answered. Use of ATVs, he, he, uh, that's a stipulation that he can't do. No wake zone by visitors. He's got one pontoon with a 25 horsepower motor. Uh, increase in road traffic. Our county uh, engineer said that the um, increase in road traffic can be handled by our local roads. Um, there's going to be pressure on surrounding lakes. Well, we are encouraged in our comprehensive plan to encourage the use of our lakes. Um, current flooding in the area, I don't know if this is going to hinder that or not, but their concern is that the people are going to go from his property to Lake Chamina and, and of course, you know, they have their enough troubles the way it is that they're going to increase the wakes and increase the erosion of their soil. Again, it's, uh, it's uh, one of our natural resources that are encouraged to be used by others. Um, I understand their concerns. And our comprehensive plan also states that we will seek opportunities to encourage and support local entrepreneurs. And this is, you know, he's putting a lot of money and a lot of sweat into this project along with his family. And uh, although I hear their, the people's concerns and I, I do, uh, I see their concerns, but I think if we follow it, he, he's followed all the rules necessary. He's, he's jumped through all the hoops like uh, Commissioner Blaine has said, and uh, I, I, I will be supporting this. Any other discussions? Commissioner Wincher. Uh, with uh, Shannon, are we going to be putting that amendment, or did we discuss that about re revising? It was part 15? of Blaine's motion. It was? Okay. All right. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Anything else, gentlemen? It's going to be a roll call. Commissioner Jelinski. Aye. Commissioner Blaine. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Myself, aye. Commissioner Wincher. Aye. Motion carried. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. All right, I've just got one last thing for Mr. you, gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, yes. commissioners, uh, I would just like to say uh, thank you for your consideration on this, and I would also like to say thank you to Land Services. They put a lot of time, effort, and resources into this, and uh, we're very appreciative, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. The last item I have is to review and sign the 2019 County Feedlot Officer Annual Report. This is a required submission to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, before our former feedlot officer left, she had prepared this and now it's coming forward. I believe that was part of your packet. Yes. Um, and so really it's, it's a report on um, the activities of the 2019 year um, and the the number of inspections and um, really it's, it's highlighting the obligations that we have to our delegation agreement and showing that we um, actually exceeded those in the number of inspections and types of activities that we needed to do. So I'm looking for approval uh, of that. Gentlemen. So moved, Mr. Chair. Motion by Commissioner Blaine. Second. Thank by Commissioner Chalinski to approve this report. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. All right. Thank you. That's Thanks, all we have. Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Community corrections. Ms. Kern. Good morning. Good morning, Nicole. Morning, Nicole. Good morning. So I am here today after you received a, an action alert from AMC in regards to community corrections funding. Actually, county probation funding is how AMC worded it. And then our MACAC um, director also sent an email encouraging support and reaching out to key legislators to urge them to support funding for county probation. And so this was put on as a topic to discuss. I am here to discuss. 
Very good. Was there a resolution attached to this? There was in the email. I don't know that it got added okay. in. Did you need that resolution too? That well, would be helpful. We've already communicated with legislators about this specific topic. I think there's kind of a um, renewed sense to do so again. I suppose um, there's some concern. I, I guess I assumed the resolution was in there, but it wasn't, so I can look for that. It was in the email that was forwarded from Commissioner. Well, Mr. Chair, I'm not exactly sure if I may. I'm not exactly sure if, if what we're looking for, but there is a draft letter. Yep, that's what we know. have in the board yes. packet was yep. what was in there. So I don't know what resolution you're talking about. And, and I would make a motion no for further discussion at the very least to have this board support that letter that is in here, in, in, in our packet. Motion made by Commissioner Jelinski to support the letter. I'll second that. Second by Commissioner Wilson. Any discussion? Mr. Chair? Yes. One of the committees through AMC that I sit on is the Public Safety Committee, um, which quite honestly I'm involved in. And community corrections, probation, whatever the term is that we want to use, has been spoke, uh, has been talked about many times in the Public Safety Committee. Beat up many times. Community corrections versus Nicole, help me. Community corrections versus county probation. County probation, that some are su that one supported in a different manner than the other. Um, I believe this letter, at the very least, is a hope of making them equal or, or getting them a little closer to being equal. And nothing has been done for quite some time when it comes time to supporting community corrections with which Morrison County is part of, if I'm using the right terms, and I think, I think that I am. And th thus, this is one that I'm gonna support fully because, um, again, I sit on the Public Safety Committee through AMC, and we have talked about this over and over and over and over again, and it's once again being brought to us because obviously it's not getting the same attention as Help me again. Probation? Department of Corrections and County Probation. Thank, thank yes. you. So, Mr. Chair, if I could, what I would suggest is that we formulate this to um, be ready in a letter for Mr. Chair to support if the board wishes to do so, and we'll get it to the legislators that um, represent us. Very good. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, thank you. Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. Work with Tabitha to get that. Sure. Yep, thanks, Nicole. Yeah. Sorry about that, Dem. I no thought problem. I read one. It, it's just another format. It yeah, indicates support, and so I'll write it in a fashion that identifies that you addressed it, you voted, and you supported that, and so continue to um, urge their support as well. Um, and Mr. Chair, Chelsea called and asked that I um, ask you to approve warrants uh, today. She's busy collecting taxes. Gentlemen? Motion to pay all the bills. Second. Any discussion? Oh, motion made by Commissioner Winter, second by Commissioner Blaine. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Roll call. Yep. Yeah. Uh, see if you're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> they are, yes. On a day when we're dressed correctly? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Blaine. Question that? Commissioner Blaine votes aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Myself, aye. Commissioner Winter? Aye. Commissioner Jelinski? Aye. Motion carried. I have a yep, report. I have um, one action item for you today that's in the board packet, and then we have a couple other discussion items. Um, the county engineer is due for reappointment um, within the statute that identifies that we have a licensed engineer. It, it calls out an appointment process for that. And so Mr. Bukowski's appointment is coming due in June of 2020. So my recommendation is certainly to reappoint him um, for another four year term and hope um, his excellent service can continue. So that's for your consideration. Gentlemen. I'll make a motion. Motion by Commissioner Wilson. Second. Second, Second by Commissioner Blaine. Any discussion? All in, all in favor of that motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried.
All right, perfect. Um, so a couple of discussion items. One thing I wanted to kind of give you guys an update on is what we've been doing to prepare for reopening our doors physically. I mean, we've been open for business. Everybody's been working very hard to try to serve clients and customers and residences in the way that we can best during this, this strange time. Um, some of the things that we've done, and just so you're aware, um, is that we do have plexiglass shields ordered, and they should be in this week for um, counters that don't have glass for um, interview rooms in which people would meet with clientele so we can make sure that we have uh, kind of protection put in place. We have some hand sanitizer stations ordered in here and getting the parts and should be by the end of this week to make sure that folks have access to that in addition to public restrooms to wash hands and things of that nature. Um, we are meeting as a leadership group tomorrow morning, Is it today's Tuesday, tomorrow morning to talk a little bit more about processes in terms of customer flow and how we can encourage appointments and try to vet or, or meter those that come into the building so there aren't too many people in one time. Um, we have floor decals uh, put in place or will be put in place for spacing and social distancing to kind of remind folks of that. So there's a lot of things that we're putting in place in the hopes that we, we can open um, our doors next week. And when I was talking to the radio station this morning, um, I had mentioned much of what we do is contingent upon different state agencies and what they are allowing, because we are an arm of the state in terms of how we and what we do. And a good example of that is motor vehicle, is the Department of Public Safety allowing um, us to do business in a certain way, allowing us to do business at certain times. Um, and all of that will impact what we can do. Um, one thing that I'm, I'm very excited about is some software that we've looked at that was developed um, by uh, a, a company that developed a software we already use um, that allows us to take appointments and kind of be able to interact with a client or customer that has an appointment in kind of real time almost. So this software that we're looking at, we're going to hopefully implement um, and kind of start to roll out today, is one that will allow customers or residents, you know, it's hard to, clients, whatever it might be, to go online or to call in. So it could either be a staff person doing this process for somebody if they don't have access to either a smartphone or a computer or them doing it themselves. And they would be able to schedule an appointment of service, whatever it is they'd like in the various areas. You know, we do so many different things. So for example, um, I envision this to be say, once we can start doing driver's license, we don't know exactly when that'll be, but once we could start doing that, somebody could go online and say, I'd like to schedule an appointment for a driver's license. And so they would be able to go and say, well, what kind of driver's license do you want? And say, a uh, real ID. And so they would make an appointment for that. And we'd be able to kind of articulate when we can accept the different appointments, you know, based on the staffing level that we have. And they would be able to, to um, reserve that spot. And then it would shoot them, potentially could shoot them a text message or an email message that says, here's your appointment and here's a link to the state website that tells you what documentation you need for that specific transaction. And so then they would be directed to that place and hopefully then come prepared because it's it's on a client to make sure they do that. And then once they get, they would be directed once they get to the government center to check in remotely. So it would allow them to say, I'm here, stay in, I'm gonna stay in my vehicle, but I'm here. And so then that will interface with a, a software program in the office. And so once that employee is ready for somebody, they can say, come on in. And so then they'll be coming in and they'll be able to assume and, you know, presumably have all of their materials and be able to be helped then. Um, and that will prevent long lines of people just coming in and waiting and not being able to meet social distance requirements. I actually think, you know, like I told Ron this morning, it's I think there's some good coming out of this in terms of how we do business. Because uh, as you know, Chelsea and Denise and I were talking how we how things have been going, in particular for that service. People have been coming, and they don't know if it's going to take 10 minutes. They don't know if there's going to be a line, and it's going to take hours. And I think everybody, both staff and customers, are going to be much oh, happier or feel better served by being able to know that they can schedule appointment and know when they can come in and get that service. Same for 
um, the appraisers and the assessor's office, scheduling an appointment like Amy said, and if we know that they're coming in and we know what their questions are through some vetting process, we, we can conduct this transaction in a very short period of time because we're ready for them and we know they're there. In Brad's office, um, we're going to have to be able to allow for people to walk in. You know, we're going to have to do that in some form or fashion. But I think a vast majority of people, or a lot of people, would really appreciate the ability to know that when they come in, they're going to come in at a time because they've set that and we know that, that we, they can be helped. So I think there's some good things that are gonna come out of this. And so I'm hopeful that this software can meet those needs. There are a number of counties that are looking at it. I think those that are developing it really hit the mark in terms of not just setting appointments, but having that interface and interaction with those that made an appointment so they know what to do and when. So we're gonna, we're gonna look at that, we're gonna roll it out. Um, it's relatively inexpensive, um, but we did need to make a call because I need to have this, you know, ready by next week, hopefully, um, that it was, it was like a $29 a month, uh, subscription for the entire organization. And then it's based upon a per, um, message delivery in terms of a, a cost for that. Um, but for an example, right now us doing tabs, which we are able to do tabs. Um, we are mailing them back to people. We are emailing back and forth. We are calling cause we don't have all the information necessarily, but we are, um, mailing those back and that's a 50 cent addition to the transaction that we have and so this process if we're able to do it would be far less um, than that because I don't think you would have um, as many text messages or emails going back and forth and so th there is a cost to it but it's also kind of meeting a need that we have to have in place in order to safely operate and serve people um, face to face. And so if we end up not using it or if we can reduce the number of messages, that reduces the cost. And so uh, I'm, I'm anxious and excited about the opportunity to maybe kind of improve business in addition to really operating safely and getting people back in the building so we can do what we're meant to do, which is help them. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, you know, land services, um, some functions in the uh, recorder's office, some functions in the auditor treasurer's office, health and human services, um, various public interfacing customers or offices can open and we can work through that once that stay at home, home order is lifted, which we'll all learn whether that's the case this week. Um, but we'll do so in a way that's limited and encouraging appointments and making sure it's safe in that environment. Some functions like motor vehicle, we're gonna have to take direction from the state and see what it is that they allow us to do when. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, good. good work being done on it. I'm, I'm anxious and I think we're going to be prepared as we can be. Um, the other component that I, we had talked about, or um, a couple of you had mentioned to me, so we did some, some work quickly this morning here to take a look at what it is we could do um, when it comes to businesses that are um, forced to be closed right now during this time. Um, we all, I think, understand the hardship that's there, and I know you've expressed um, concern over that, and I think that's valid, and I think that there are a number of co um, county residents residences who are either business owners or who work at small businesses or who, um, you know, whose lives are impacted drastically and not for the good. And so this, this is a resolution that um, I can read for you and you guys can consider and modify as you deem necessary. It wasn't in the packet because we just did talk about that this morning, but if I may. Mm -hmm. Morrison County Board of Commissioners, a resolution to advise and encourage support for reopening of businesses who will follow requirements on social distancing, safety, and follow state, local, and CDC guidelines. Whereas Governor Tim Walz issued an executive order 2001 on March 13, 2020, declaring a peacetime emergency because of COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas on March 16, 2020, Governor Tim Walz issued executive order 2004, ordering the closure of bars, restaurants, and places of public accommodation. This order required Minnesota to take additional proactive measures to slow the spread of this pandemic. And was, whereas Morrison County has followed these executive orders and recommendations of the stay-at-home order that was issued on March 27, 2020, and ultimately further extended through May 17, 2020, at 11.59 p.m., whereas Morrison County businesses have followed the executive orders. 
And whereas this order has caused undue hardship and financial loss to many businesses, both large and small, many of whom may never recover from this financial catastrophe. Businesses continue to have financial strain due to insurance, taxes, rent, electrical, heating, and other costs. And whereas this continued order has affected their base of employees, many of them cannot withstand the loss of wages and will be seeking other employment. This will cause undue hardship and financial impact to owners as they try to hire and train new staff. And whereas rural Minnesota has followed the CDC guidelines under federal regional gating requirements and have met the three phases that are recommended. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Morrison County Board advise and encourage Governor Tim Walls to let expire the initial order on May, March 27, 2020, that ultimately, and let it ex, to let expire the initial order on March 27, 2020, at May 17, 11:59 p.m. And any subsequent orders requiring the closures of bars, restaurant, and other places of public accommodation, allowing the opening of these establishments. Now, therefore, be it further resolved, said opening shall require appropriate procedure and best practices for the public to follow requirements on social distancing, safety, and following state, local, and CDC guidelines. Mr. Chair? Commissioner Wilson. I believe that we should approve this and send this to the governor's office. I'm getting real tired in our small towns of these places that can't open up that would have maybe four or five people in their store at one time at the most, and I can go to Brainerd or St. Cloud and I can go to a Menards and stand in line with a thousand people. I says, I, I just think this is totally ridiculous. Um, I think that me as a person, I understand what the rules are, staying six feet apart, possibly wearing a mask, um, and I see people doing that, and I think that people should have a choice whether they wanna go into an establishment or they don't, and I'm afraid the governor's not gonna open this up and I think we should do whatever we can do to to do this because we are losing businesses that will not come back in our small towns and I just don't even know where the justification comes in uh, to do this when you allow all these big box stores to open up and I'm glad they're open don't get me wrong that's not the point but the point is you're closing down our stores in town like I says that would have five people in there at one time at the max you know and you don't even allow them to do business and I think that's totally wrong. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I couldn't say it any better myself. Gentlemen? And myself, too. I agree with uh, Commissioner Wilson. Again, it's, it's ridiculous, and I, I, I think he uh, should open up again. I'm concerned that, that come Monday or Tuesday when he's going to make this, because I think the legislator uh, goes home on the 16th or 12th of June, that he may extend it to, until then. That's and then they'd have to call a special session to bring them back. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm all for this here. Let's get the businesses open. And it's going to take a while. If you'd open them today, not everybody's going to go rush to the restaurant. They're going to have to get used to this or the, the bars or whatever it may be. And it, it's, yeah, let's, let's get the, our county businesses open. Gentlemen, could I get a motion and second to approve this? I'll make a motion. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Wilson, second by Commissioner Winter to approve this resolution, encouraging support for reopening businesses. Any discussion? Mr. Chair? Commissioner Jelinski. I'm certainly not against this. However, this is a big undertaking by any business and by any person going into that business. If we truly are going to encourage, and that's all we can do, I believe, to support opening up those businesses, following social distancing safety, following state, local, CDC guidance. Um, my anticipation would be, if I'm a business owner, I'm gonna have a sign on my door that says, maybe, just saying maybe, that we have to keep our social distancing, that you're gonna put a mask on or you're not coming into my store. And of course, there's gonna be somebody that's gonna say, I'm coming in anyway and I'm not gonna wear a mask, I think, and I don't know the answer to this for sure, but I think as a business, if I have the authority to say no, sho no shoes, no shirt, no service, I think I have the same authority to say, and no mask, you're not coming in. I don't know that I'm right, I, and I truly don't, 
but, but I think it's a big undertaking, no matter what, uh, by the business and by the public that's going to support that business to understand what it is that we're dealing on. That's all. And I just also want to reiterate that this has nothing to do with the governor. I wouldn't want to be an issue as in making the decisions that he has to make. It's just I think it's time we stand and uh, try to protect our small businesses that we have in our community. Um, it's, it's, it's sad what it's, what's happening to some of these small businesses. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion carried. Mr. Chair, what, what we'll do um, is, what I intend to do is communicate directly with our local representation, so Senator Gazelka and Representative Krisha, who I know are working hard to, to try to make movement on this also, and then we will um, contact the governor's office and send that directly there as well um, and just share our feelings, and we'll do that today um, because it is coming... Um, well, what did Brad say? Tomorrow is the 13th. Is today the 12th? That that peacetime emergency declaration is going to be considered and addressed, and so this is timely, and we will get it out ASAP. I so, thank, I thank you for that. No problem. Um, no problem at all. But thank you for for your work with it. Um, we will be having further discussions in terms of what the responses for this organization, as I mentioned earlier, um, with regard to what happens next week. Um, but I'm hoping with all of the different phases of, you know, approach that we're taking that we'll be ready to serve in some capacity to the best of our ability um, uh, in person um, with limited contact and all of that soon. So that's all I have, Mr. Chair. No, okay. later. All right. Anything else, gentlemen? <coughs> Oh, <laughs> calendar dates. I forgot about that. Mr. Jelinski. <laughs> First, all right. <laughs> only because I think I'm ready. May, May 17th. You usually cover through everybody, Jeffrey. To the 30th? May 30th. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. On the 19th of this month at 8.30 in the morning, we've got a planning session. On the 20th, which I believe is canceled, would be the start, I think, of Mudfest but I think it's canceled if I'm understanding right. On the 20th at 5 p.m., I've got a Hands of Hope meeting and that is scheduled to be at the boardroom here in Morrison County. On the 21st at 10 o'clock in the morning, there's an owners and operators meeting in Alexandria and that'd be from the Emergency Services Board. At seven o'clock that night, I've got an Egg Society meeting at the fairgrounds. On the 26th of this month, at 9 o'clock in the morning, we've got a county board meeting. And on the 28th, we'll see if this happens, at 1230, I've got a state emergency communications board meeting at St. Paul. And Mr. Chair, I believe that's all I've got. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Wincher. Okay, on the 19th, I have a webinar for Great River Regional Library at 6 o'clock. Uh, on Friday the 22nd, I have a phone webinar, I don't know what they call it, but Soil and Water at 8 o'clock on the Friday the 22nd. And on the 26th, there's a planning commission, I believe that's a webinar too, at 7 p.m. on the 26th. And other than that, you have got me covered. Commissioner Wilson? Uh, on the 19th, they got community development at 1215. On the 21st, I got RTCC board meeting at 10. On the 22nd, I got Mississippi Headwaters at uh, 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, you said? Yeah. And that's where this time? Uh, well, it's going to be probably over the internet, but otherwise it's at Walker. Um, and that's it. You don't have the airport commission that week? No, I, no, we just had it. Commissioner Blaine? Um, Mr. Chair, on, uh, on uh, May 20th at, uh, at 10 a.m. in the morning, I have a Region 5 Development Commission board meeting uh, for the Board of Directors. 
um, uh, at, at personal finance committee meeting. Um, You know, I think this is, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say this is still gonna be um, um, uh, virtual. If that would change, I would let you know. Okay. Um, and then um, the, uh, the only other uh, meeting on the 28th then would be the, um, would be the Region 5, uh, regular Region 5 uh, commission meeting um, at 6 p.m. on on, uh, on the 28th, and I, I would expect that also to be um, uh, virtual at that point. Other than that, um, uh, I have nothing else, Mr. Chair. Uh, the only thing different I have to add is on the uh, 26th at 1.30, HRA, tentatively. At the HRA office? Yes. And that'll be it. Anything else, gentlemen? Mr. Chair, I'll move to adjourn. Motion made by Commissioner Blaine. Second. Second by Commissioner Wincher to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Meeting adjourned. Good job there, Mr. Chair. <laughs>